I invite you to take your Bibles, and we are going to read the message from God for today. It's going to be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 17 to 21. Again, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 17 to 21. The slides are going to present those verses. This is the word of God. The 70 returning with joy and say, Lord, even the demons, demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like a lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on a snake and a scorpion and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we do come before you thankful for your word, your truth revealed to us, your children. We're humbled that you would, uh, that you would find us uh, worthy to be sent out, to be used for your glory. So we come before you in this space and time, and we seek you, Lord, and we ask that you would open our eyes that we would see, open our ears that we would hear, open our minds that we would come to know, understand your word, our hearts that we would feel its power, and then in response, Lord, use us. Use us as your servants. Open our hands that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I haven't had a first-hand experience of this, but I've been hearing about this for a number of years, and I find it fascinating and, and, and quite interesting. So the coaches at Tomball High School on the football team, uh, whenever they watch film on the day after the game, uh, they have a, uh, um, an interesting pattern. One of the coaches goes out and finds comedy clips from the game. I mean, and comedy clips seems to, 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 to maybe be obvious, you know, like a turf monster or running backs breaking away and, you know, he's at the 20, he's at the 10, and he fell on his face. And everybody like, gets to joke around and clown at, with one another at, at silly things like that. So sometimes it's directly involved in the play. And then other times it's things that no one else sees. And the coaches are really good at finding these things. I don't know. So, so like, if the play is a, is, a, is, a, is a pitch to the right, they'll find a left tackle, like, that blocks someone out of bounds and pancakes them on the opposite sideline. Like, no one sees it because it's so far from the play, but the coaches will put it on comedy clips to be sure everybody notices and gets to laugh with one another. Now, sometimes those things are our greatest successes, and sometimes they're our greatest failures, but they get to laugh with one another. But then the coaches, it's not just what happens on the field that they see. I don't, I don't understand this. Sometimes they see what happens on the sidelines, and sometimes they even see what happens in the stands. I mean, that doesn't seem to be part of the scene, but, but they caught one kid uh, like uh, at the edge of the stands in a critical period of the game that was praying, like, like in a posture of prayer, not even watching the game, in a posture of prayer during the play. And when it didn't go through, then he, he decided he needed to be more devout in his prayers, right? I mean, have you ever done this? Like Altuve was up to bat last night. We needed one run to not get beat by the stinking Royals again. And so you changed your posture of prayer during his at bat. Anyone? Okay, just me. Sorry. So... <laughs> So, you know, you know the, the kid changes his posture of prayer, changes it again, and then whenever it absolutely fails and the fourth and whatever wasn't achieved, just falls flat like, like oh, Jesus, where were you? 
these comedy clips let, let us see a full picture, see what's happening in the play, and, and then in the periphery, and then on the margins. And I think that that's uh, Jesus' uh, intention for us in this passage. He, he wants us to see what is happening and celebrates that and can affirm that. We'll get more to that in a second. But he also opens our eyes to the bigger matters, broader broader matters of what's taking place in our lives and in the world around us. So brothers and sisters, we're, we're going to spend um, more than normal amount of time walking through step by step this passage of scripture. Now, now some of you are like, yes, I love it when Jason does this. And others of you are like, oh my gosh, just tell me another funny story. So um, wherever you are in that, I think God has something for us in this passage. So if you do have your Bibles, I want you to follow along there because these few verses are jam packed. And there's a variety of things that as we read this together, uh, we could be distracted and we could think, uh, where is this? And, and it could move us to the periphery, but it all is coming together in a, a, a fantastic teaching. So the very first thing that we have to notice is we open up with verse 17, right? The 72 returned. And, and one of the things that we don't realize is there is a massive elapse of time between verse 16 and verse 17. I mean, sometimes as scripture moves along, uh, we, we don't realize what pace or what clip we're moving at. And, and oftentimes we don't read it uh, as, as a continued narrative. We read it in chunks for our devotional or for, uh, for teaching on a Sunday morning. And so we miss this. But, but here's what happened. Jesus gives instructions. First, he sent out the 12. Then he sends out the 72. This is his exponential movement of, uh, of sending out all the way to us being sent out today. So he sends out the 72, and the 72 are given some instructions. The very first thing in, in verse 3 of chapter 10, so ahead, ahead of where we began today, verse 3 says, go. So he says, 72 Go. You're being commissioned. You're being given purpose. You're being invited to step forward on my behalf. And then the second thing is, in verse 7, he says, stay there. Now, he gives some instructions like, hey, you show up in a town or show up at a house and they reject you, you know, shake it off, walk on, no big deal. But then he says, hey, if you're welcomed, if there's an invitation, if there's a willingness, an open spirit to receive a message, stay there. So the 72 are sent out, and they're invited to stay where they go, and they're given purpose as well. In verse 8, here's the purpose, or verse 9, excuse me. It says, heal the sick who are there and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Heal and proclaim. Uh, th these are two very specific purposes of the 72. They're to go, they're to stay there a while, they're to give physical healing, and they're to give spiritual healing. The kingdom of God is very near. It's like, it's like right here. Like, like you could see it if you didn't have a veil over your eyes. Like, like you could feel it if you were willing to step into it. Like this, this intimacy of this kingdom here and now is powerful and profound. So they are given a commissioning for physical and for spiritual healing. And verse 16 just kind of encapsulate Jesus' instructions. Whoever listens to you, listens to me, rejects you, rejects me. Um, and then verse, 70, verse 17 says, and the 72 returned. All right, so now you're with me. You, you see, like, there's a lot of time that elapsed there. They were sent out and they had a purpose, they had, they had instruction, and so much took place. And we don't know what cities they went to. We don't know what people they interacted with. We don't know the details of the healings or the details of the, of the testimony of the kingdom of God. But we know they went out and they returned. Huge amount of time that they are coming back and they are testifying to. And he, here they have three different 
uh, three different uh, elements in verse 17 that characterize this return. And it, and it really summarizes all that took place while they were out. The very first thing is they returned with joy. Underline with joy. They were, they were so joyful about what God had done. And, and I find this outstanding because certainly some of the 72, if not all of the 72, during this large elapse of time experienced rejection, experienced persecution, experienced uh, uh, walls coming up in people's lives where they were not willing to receive this gospel teaching or receive this healing. Certainly they had hardship. Many of them probably experienced hunger. They absolutely would have experienced the physical exhaustion of this mission that they had been sent out on, but they also experienced outstanding fruit. God moved in them and through them, and they were able to bear witness to that, participate in it. And so they returned first and foremost with joy. They have something to celebrate. God is on the move. Uh, the Holy Spirit is winning the day. Jesus' testimony is true. The kingdom is here. And now this is magnificent. And they just have to celebrate. Like celebration just is welling up from them and overflowing. And I can just imagine how this went. Like the 72 didn't all go together, right? It wasn't like a 72-person evangelistic mission in one town to another. It wasn't like we said, hey, all of us over here, we're going to go over there and we're going to give testimony and we're going to heal. No, it was like, it was in pairs. And so they hadn't seen each other. And so your joy became your joy, became your joy, became your joy, became your joy and yours. And all together, it just was welling up and they testified to Jesus. This is great joy we have to share together and then the second thing that we have to clearly hear, it says, even the demons, this is their testimony to Jesus, even the demons submit to us. So he was commissioning them for physical healing and for spiritual healing. And I find it very interesting that the, dis the disciples, not just the 12, but the 72, those that were following Jesus and were sent out, their first commentary to Jesus is about what happened with the spiritual forces. It's almost as though they were more surprised, more perplexed, that the spiritual forces responded to the power of Jesus than they were surprised that the physical ailments were healed. And I think that that might be, if I was actually going to diagnose our generation, it might be opposite for us. If we were sent out to heal physically and spiritually, we might be more surprised that physical healing took place than we would be if spiritual healing took place. But the disciples, the 72, they had come to, to believe this and witness it. And so physical and spiritual healing, they said, even the demons... Even the demons, even the spiritual forces of wickedness responded and were cast out. And then the third thing, just in this one single verse is, in the name of Jesus, in your name. This happened in your name. They were very clear. They, they were not confused. They didn't think that this took place or this occurred because they were so strong or they were so right or they were so pious or, or they were so holy. This occurred in and through the power and name of Jesus. And, and maybe that's in and of itself a sermon, a message for all of us to receive that when you go out in Jesus' name, when you are being commissioned and sent out, anything that takes place is all to his praise, glory, and honor. And they were clear on that, and we must be clear on it as well. So they're rejoicing. They're rejoicing that the physical and spiritual healing is taking place, and they're rejoicing because of Jesus' authority and power that was exercised in their presence. And then we're going to turn to verse 18. Verse 18 um, 
Now, sometimes people will eisegete this. Uh, that means that you're putting yourself into this passage, or they, they will, they will uh, s- separate this verse from the context with which it's taken and find all sorts of, of, of odd meaning. So we're going to break it down very quickly. You ready? Uh, Jesus says to them uh, that I saw, Jesus is saying, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, some are, are, are thinking in a, in a more literal sense, and they are uh, they're thinking that this is one of those evidences of Satan being cast out of heaven, um, which, which is a totally different uh, biblical context. In this context, I want us to break it down. This is a simile. Do you remember? Do you remember English? A simile is a comparison that uses words like or as. Okay, so Satan fell. Lightning. Like. So the way that Satan fell while you were doing your work, 72, was the same way that lightning falls from heaven. It's like a flash. It's like a bang. There's with power, and it's quick, and there's no mistaking it. It's visible. The world can see and know. It's not just something that's isolated or that some see, but everyone can see. Think about all of the ways that you could compare lightning, a strike of lightning, with the way that Satan could fall. I love it. Jesus gives this imagery of what he bore witness to as the 72 were accomplishing his commissioned purposes. Satan fell like lightning from the sky. And by the way, that word heaven there is also used in other translations as sky or from the heavenly places, like the, the realm above the earth, not, not as like, like eternity kingdom, but the sky. And all of a sudden, this, this power, Jesus is saying, I wasn't there in person, but I could bear witness because of the, 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 the uh, extraordinary way that I saw lightning, flashes of lightning, like Satan was falling. Magnificent. And so Jesus continues on and he says, uh, he says, I've given you, in verse 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. So then people might say, are we about to handle snakes up in her? Um, are, we, are, are we up in the mountains of the Appalachia in church and we about to handle? Okay. So let me frame this up, like snakes and scorpions. So snakes, we are, to see this reference to the garden, that the snake is the, the evil one, the tempter, the, the force of wickedness that is to drive us from our right position with God. And a scorpion is uh, the, the largest of the insects, poisonous creature that causes pain, harm, and death. So these two animals, Jesus doesn't just use here. He also refers to these animals just one chapter later in, verse, in chapter 11, verse, uh, verse, uh, ele- verse 11. It says, which of you fathers, Jesus is talking here, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, gives him a? Scorpion. So th- this is snake and scorpion for Jesus are symbolic uh, animals for pain, for harm, for evil. And so we could very well here in this, in this verse say, I've given you authority to trample on evil. To, to, to crush evil's head so that it has no authority any longer, and that nothing will harm you. That evil cannot have power over you because I have sent you out in my power. And just ha- as evil has no power over Jesus, so evil will have no power over you. 
And you, now you can see why we're walking through this because as, as Dario read that from this verse from the altar, some of us hear like, like this um, uh, snakes and scorpions bit or Satan fall like lightning bit and we get distracted. We see what's happening in the stands and we miss what's on the field. We, we're not uh, paying clear enough attention to the primary purpose of this teaching for Jesus, which we're getting to. So we have in verse 18 and 19, Satan falls like lightning from heaven, a simile, and I've given you authority to trample snakes and scorpions. They won't harm you. And then verse 20. All right, this is, this is a moment where translations come up a little bit empty, so be patient with me a second. The, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, the, sometimes we miss things in languages. I know a lot of, of, of you are taking SSL, and so you're beginning to realize Spanish is a second language. You're beginning to realize the gap between languages. It's hard to understand one another, and so things mean different things in different contexts, and so uh, bear with us here. In verse 20, it says, how However, do not rejoice that a spirit submits to you, but rejoice in the, uh, that your names are written in heaven. And, and we, can, we could think that Jesus is offering rebuke in the way that it's written. However, do not rejoice that spirits submit to you. I, it, you could see that that says, like, I'm rebuking you. Don't rejoice that spirits re- submit to you. But there are two words that are missing that I think change the context for us. It's in tauto. That's, and I, I probably said that was with a Spanish accent, by the way. That was, that was uh, I don't think Greek and Spanish sound the same. Uh, but that is how the word tauto, T-O-U-T-O with a hard O. In tauto. However, in tauto, do not. And that, those words in tauto are not there. In this NIV translation. So if we add those in, in tauto means in this matter. In concerning what we've been talking about, in the matter of, of what you've experienced and, and this engagement. So however in this, in this, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. But rejoice. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus is redirecting their joy. He's inviting them into a deeper place of joy and understanding that, that, that yes, it is joyful to know that even the demons submit, but Jesus is saying more than that, the, the power and authority that I have sent you out and, and your exercise of that bears witness to the fact that not only is the kingdom of heaven here and now, but also your names are written in heaven, that, that you are uh, inheriting the kingdom uh, as a part of my family. And he wants, uh, he wants all of the 72 to know that there is an even more profound joy that is theirs. And then Jesus, in verse 21, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, says, I praise you, Father, because you have hidden these things and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. By the way, the word this and the word revealed, I would parallel together based on the Greek construct instead of the word this and the word hidden, which uh, I don't have time to, to, to dive deeply in, but you, you could study that and see that in greater context in your own study. So here's what Jesus does in this teaching. He sends you out and you return in joy. Jesus affirms that joy and then redirects that joy to the even more profound reason for joy. And then Jesus celebrates in joy through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Did you, did you see that move of celebration that Jesus is involved in with you, with us together? That when we have reason to celebrate, when we rejoice in what Jesus rejoices in, when we're doing the things that Jesus taught us to do and we're experiencing victory in and through him, we have reason to celebrate. And Jesus comes alongside us in that celebration, affirms that, and then lifts up even deeper meaning to that joy so that he could join in that celebration with us together. This is what discipleship looks like. This is what it means to be in faithful relationships, in koinonia, in community with one another. When I am with my covenant group, with my small group, and I come in and I share witness uh, to a way in which God is moving in my life, ways in which I have not experienced victory prior, or ways in which I had been drastically, severely suffering. And I come in and celebrate what Jesus is doing there. My small group, my covenant, celebrates with me. And not only that, they ask questions and they say, and whenever I am failing to get the full picture, whenever I'm only seeing one part, they open my eyes to the greater grandeur of what God is doing in my life and they are redirecting my celebration and celebrating with me. This is what discipleship looks like. Jesus models it for us with the 72 and invites us into this life of discipleship and celebration together. If you're not yet a part of a small group, if you don't have a group of people that will join in spiritual celebration with you, I invite you to find that here at Covenant because God is glorified and we are able to celebrate the inbreaking of the kingdom in our midst, as is witnessed here with the 72 and with each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you extraordinarily humbled that, that you would commission us, that you would give us power, that you would give us authority that you would invite us into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, I ask now in this space and time that you, that you would send us out. Send us out to grow in holiness of heart and life. Send us out to proclaim your good news. The kingdom come here on earth. Lord, send us out to heal to heal physical and spiritual brokenness. And Lord, we know, we know that that starts in us. And we desperately need and require that healing as well. Lord, I ask and pray that you would make a way in us for rejoicing. Let us Celebrate what you celebrate in. Let us rejoice in what you rejoice in. Open our eyes to see the bigger picture. That you would be glorified amongst us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.